Hello everyone, good afternoon and welcome to B-Sides Las Vegas. I am Harsha Nikhar and this talk is on navigating security pitfalls during M&A, playbooks and strategy for doing acquisitions right, given by our speaker Vinay Prabhu Shankar. Um, before we begin, I have a few announcements to make. We would like to thank our sponsors, especially our diamond sponsor, Adobe, and our gold sponsors, Prisma Cloud, Blue Cat, Toyota. It's with their support, along with our other sponsors, donors, and volunteers that make this event possible. These talks are being live streamed, and as a courtesy to our speakers and audience, we ask that you check to make sure that your cell phones are set to silent. If you have any question, please use the audience microphone so that YouTube can hear you as well. And with that, let's get started. Please welcome Vinay. Hey, hey. Hope everyone is having fun at B-Sides. Last few talks, so bear with me. Awesome. So I'm here to talk about M&A security. Um, security is, is a complex landscape, and mergers and acquisitions even more so. Uh, and it's one of the critical aspects of, of, of that requires careful consideration. So hopefully, no matter where you are in your careers, and if you've done M&A or not, hopefully you have some takeaways here to go and apply back to your programs. I'm Vinay, I work for, as a security lead at Snap. I primarily have worked in product security before this. Uh, I, was, I've, I was lucky to be associated with over 20 plus acquisitions throughout my career. Um, and one of the most interesting ones was Yammer. So anyone remember Yammer? Yeah? Yeah, there you go. That was Microsoft's attempt at social network, so. But they're doing pretty well with LinkedIn, so there's that. Uh, and that was at, when I was at Microsoft. Uh, we are hiring, so please come and talk to me and learn more about our InfoSec program. We also have a security lead here from our company who's also hiring, so please go talk to him. And we do have a bug bounty program on HackerOne, so please participate, and if you want to know more, uh, please come chat with me. This was another co-presenter of mine who unfortunately couldn't make it due to family emergency, but hey, thanks Murli, and hope everything is good with, with you and your family. So today I'll be talking and giving you a crash course on, on m and this, this These are all the things that I wish I had known when I took over the m and program and we started doing this as, as just a security engineer who started doing mergers and acquisitions. So hopefully a lot of you will see how the sausage is made behind the scenes and sort of get a glimpse into the M&A security world, which is sort of not very common, right? Not, not, a, not a lot of companies are doing M&A. M&A is kind of like, you know, hidden, cor hidden and it's within the corporate development strategy teams. So hopefully you can take away some of this and see if it actually applies for yourself. We'll talk about some key stakeholders, how M&A is done, what are the different strategies, and we'll talk a lot about the pre-acquisition phase, which is all the things that happen before a deal is closed, and then I'll talk about what happens after the deal is closed. And basically throughout, I'll give you some case studies, some of things that may or may not have happened you know, at my company, and then not, 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 nothing can be uh, accepted or denied, uh, and then hopefully you'll have some takeaways, and hold your questions for the end, or if you have a question that in the middle, please feel free to walk up to the podium. Um, just a few disclaimers. You know, the obligatory or mileage may vary. Um, this worked for us. We had a short time frame to do M&As, and we did about 20 of them. So we had to do a lot of innovation and sort of adopt new processes. You might have a bigger, much bigger and better M&A program, or you might be starting off. So you know, take, take it with a grain of salt. And, and if there are areas of improvement, please come talk to me. And if you want ideas or these playbooks or these strategies, happy to pass them along. Oh, and if any of you did not watch Succession on HBO, I'm sorry, the memes might, may or may not make sense to you. So hopefully that, that you know, forgive me. <laughs> awesome. So essentially this slide, think, take, 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 it, take this slide and see how the M&A is moving from, from you know, a very busy cycle to it's starting to slow down now. Right? So M&A is very cyclical. So during the boom cycle and the bust cycle, it goes really up. Because when valuations are very high, companies go shopping. And when valuations are really low, companies you know, go for sale. So this is the transition period. So 2023, think of it as like a slow period when there is economic uncertainty, valuations are getting readjusted. So a lot of M&A activity has slowed down, but the general trend is it's going to start picking up. And then here, if you see, it also depends on sectors. There are some sectors where it's still kind of 
happening, right? Like in energy and natural resources, it's still happening. Financial services, it's still happening. So the so generally the valuation EBITDA give you gives you an idea of whether the M&A activity is happening or not. So in tech, if you see, it's fallen down drastically, but that that kind of like helps reset and reevaluate for next year. So the general takeaway is that deal making is resuming. So be prepared, and and so hopefully you can take back some of this to your team for next years. So one of the things that M&A program works is it comes from the corporate development strategy. So there is a team, centralized team within your company called Corp Dev. So if anyone hears the word Corp Dev, they're just a, a team who's thinking about how to do M&A, right? So you're a, you're a business development manager or you, you, you're a VP, you go to this team and you say, hey, I want to do an M&A. Uh, I want to add a new product or service or feature to my portfolio. And then the team goes and evaluates it and sees potential options. Sometimes you can bring options to them. And they then pursue that deal. And that's sort of like how the M&A life cycle begins. So one of the useful things for you to understand as a security team or a security org is what your company's strategy is. Your company could just be an opportunist. Whereas no, that, those are companies like DocuSign or UiPath, right? They're very strategic. They don't do do it do too many um, you know acquisitions. Then you have the companies like Spotify or Roku or Slack, which kind of acquires to just add new product capability, right? So that's that. Those companies, there's, it's moderate deal volume, and it's very very focused on specific business units. Then you have the large companies like right? Microsoft, Google, which have huge carb dev teams, right? So they have entire teams which specialize in M&As. They have like teams which can help with integration, with due diligence, and that's a much different and more uh, complex landscape. And then you have the serial acquirers, right? So all the companies out there, they're hoping to get acquired by Palo Alto Network someday, and then, you know, you know. So that's, that's sort of like the serial acquirer strategy. So depending on where your company fits, you can then plan, uh, plan your own InfoSec program around that. So a good thing to be to do is just go talk to your cognitive strategy team and, and say, hey, you know, where do we fall? What's our six month to one year roadmap? Uh, do, do, be prepared. And, and the business likes this. And, and if you see, if depending on where you land here, your deal volume will either increase or decrease. So, so basic takeaway, go talk to your cognitive team. Don't be scared. Get input from them so that you can plan your InfoSec program accordingly. Uh, so why do you why do why should we care about MA security right like a lot of things, a lot of we have as security people we have a lot of priorities right Every, everything is a priority so how, why do we care about this well one good reason is the classic you know the unknown risk right so just like just like open source security you have MA where you might have the most robust defenses within your org, but then you hire a 20% team or 30% team whose focus is not security, and they come in with, with either a vulnerability or they come in with like malware, and then your whole ecosystem is then gets affected, right? So it's important to look at m and and do the right due diligence so that you, your whole security posture doesn't get affected by sort of the weakest link, right? Like it's back to basics. This is, this is just basics. Um, so let's think about also the business impact. Who, who here remembers Yahoo deal, right? Like, so Yahoo, when they, yeah, exactly, right? When they, when they did the due diligence, they found that Yahoo had been breached. And that actually, for the first time, put a dollar value to the risk, right? So immediately their value got knocked down, and that, 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 created, that actually created input into a lot of M&A teams to start going and doing the right due diligence. And then there was Marriott, right? So Starwood at that time was one of the largest US hotel chains. And they got bought out by Marriott in 2016. I can see some people are recognizing the, the meme here. So in 2016, when they bought it, they then realized that you, the, uh, the Starwood had a breach in 2014. So for two years, their network had been breached. They had active malicious act actors within their network. And when Marriott and Starwood then integrated that systems, guess whose problem it became, right? So it just then became Marriott's problem. So Marriott had to pay massive fines. And then all of this, I mean, I'm not trying to point fingers, but essentially all of these can or could have been unearthed if they were the right due diligence strategies were done, which, which did happen with Yahoo. Uh, but just that, that's one of the reasons why you want to care about an M&A or when you're trying to buy a company is to make sure that you're not owning their risk 
or at least bring it up to the business that, hey, this risk exists, and the right evaluation or right valuation for the deal can be done. So this is sort of like the big picture or like how a M&A is done, right? So you have the whole period before the deal is closed, which is the deal is closed. So you have the pre-acquisition due diligence and post-close, there's a bunch of post-close activities that's done. Um, so I'll bring this slide up a couple of times because you'll see this over and over again, but essentially there are a bunch of activities before and then after. And then the whole deal timeline is about eight weeks, right? So you have about eight to 16 weeks, you're given only eight to 16 weeks, which is, you know, considering a lot of other priorities that your InfoSec team has, this is just a compressed timeline. And then depending on how you are going to integrate the company, you might take six months and sometimes even more than a year for integrations to occur. Large and complex deals we've had are just, you know, they just take like a year or two. Um, so yeah, so, so let me talk about each phase as we go through um, the presentation. Yeah, let's go get the deal, right? Now we know the life cycle, let's just go and get the deal done. No, it's not that simple, but anyway. So why do we do pre-acquisition due diligence? So as a security org, when you are brought into the deal, you're basically told, hey, you know, we're gonna go and acquire this company, we'll, we have about four weeks, tell us what the risk is. This is typically how it starts, like just someone will, from the cop team will reach out to you and say, like, give me the risk. So you start from, you know, from basically knowing nothing about the company. And so then one of the things, our big outcome that you want from doing this pre-acquisition due diligence is to tell the business, hey, what is actually the risk, right? Like, they don't care about like how many vulnerabilities do, you, do they have, they don't care about like how many, you know, what their, you know, what is their like EDR strategy or what their infosec strategy is. At the end of the day, you have to give them some metric or risk or a view of risk to say like, yes, these are the red flags and these need to be fixed and these are, these are okay and we can own this risk, right? So that business, make it easy for your business to be able to tell what the risks are. And the second thing is you wanna know what the security posture of the target is, right? You're acquiring a target, you wanna know what their current security posture is. Like, do they already have like everything figured out? Do they have, you know, SaaS, DAS, everything integrated? Or do you have to do a lot of work once you integrate, their, once you buy them, right? So just having that, Having, the, having a picture of their security posture will help you with your InfoSec plan for the next six months or a year, right? Otherwise you're blindfolded, you, you, you have no clue, and then all of a sudden a deal closes, and then you own all this risk. So having this in advance, your businesses will re really appreciate this, and your InfoSec and your CISO will be super happy because they, now they know what's coming down the pipeline, and half the challenge is just understanding what's coming down the pipeline. And the other thing is when you, uncover risks, when you uncover high or critical risks, you, before the, clo before the deal closes, you actually have a carrot, right? And not the stick, and I like carrots and not stick, right? So having that, you know, carrot and saying, hey, you know, go fix these before the deal closes will make your life much more easier because the team that is getting acquired actually has an incentive to go fix this, right? Everyone's gonna get quite rich if, they, if the deal goes well. So, and then the, finally the thing is once you have it, it'll help your InfoSec team to plan, prioritize the integration, which all happens in the future. Go for it, Nick. Question today. Have you seen the economic value of the deal affected based on the findings pre-close? Presumably down, but do you have any thoughts of that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, without going into too many details, we, do, we, we did have a few deals where we looked at the security posture and said, hey, this, this tech stack or this integration is gonna take much more than what we expected. And so then we had to go, go and give back that feedback. And things like, we were able to tell things like, hey, you, you would need an extra two headcounts to even bring this tech stack up to the same tech stack as, like, as our ecosystem, right? So just giving that feedback early on is super helpful for them to then be able to like value the deal correctly or at least plan for headcounts and, and how long will the integration actually take? How long can the business actually extract value from the deal? Because all of this, if you wait till the deal is done and then you go tell them that hey these are the these are the blockers we you know you cannot you know integrate it immediately then all of a sudden you're becoming a business blocker and you don't want to be that as a security team you want to be a business enabler so this is the big picture how a due diligence occurs right so imagine you're a security team you're given hey this is the target you have about 4 weeks 
you can start talking to them and go get some information from them and find out how their security posture is and tell me the risk, right? So you are then going to go to the team that you're acquiring. And then for those of you who have done M&As or Corp Dev, you know, you will remember the, 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 the due diligence software that they send you, which, which in itself is a pain and, and you know, but anyway, so you, get, you, you basically get a, uh, get, get a window of opportunity to start talking to the target. So you're usually given access to the CEO or their CISO if they even have one or their security team if they have one. But typically you have to understand depending on the size of the deal, this could be like 20% to 200 person, and then you have just engineers in sometimes, or sometimes you're just talking to, you know, like just the IT team, right? So whoever you have access to, you should make use of them by, and you, you can sell them, you can send them a due diligence form, right? And in the due diligence form, think of it, I think of this like a health form, right? You're filling, you're giving them this checklist and saying, hey, fill, fill these details out for me so that I can understand what your different tech stack is, right? Tell me what is your, what, 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 kind of, what kind of assets do you have? What cloud services do you have? What cloud hosting providers do you have? Like what is your sort of like, you know, network architecture, right? So you start with there and once you get that, you can scope an assessment. And typically you scope this assessment with the help of a third party security vendor. And one of the big reasons for using a third party security vendor is in that way, you don't have access directly to, their, to the target's IP. A lot of time the, I, the targets will just not be comfortable with you going and looking at their IP, at their source code, because hey, you're trying to acquire them and sometimes deals do fall. Like deal, not all deals go through. That's the most important thing you have to remember is like a lot of times the deals don't go through. So the targets are not comfortable giving their IP up. So using a third party as a code escrow, a lot of times is how you go over this barrier. So you go to the third party and say, hey, this is the kind of target that we are going to acquire. Here is their tech stack. Let's do a two to two to three weeks of assessment on them, right? So again, the de the timeline is super compressed. You have two to four weeks. All of this activity happens in two to four weeks, and then once you do that, they find a bunch of findings. And depending on the findings, sometimes you might go want to do a deep dive. And the, by the deep dive, I mean compromise assessment. And compromise, we'll go into details of what a compromise assessment looks like, but. If there is no compromise assessment, then you sort of like work with your internal vulnerability management team and say, hey, here is a bunch of issues that we have found. Let's track them and fix them, right? So this is sort of like a high level picture of four weeks of sort of sprint towards finding issues within your target, getting them fixed, and at the same time presenting a risk to your business. So some of the activities that our team sort of does when we look at a company to acquire a company are these, right? So we start with the architecture review. And why do we do this? A lot of times, the companies that we are acquiring, they're usually with, between five and you know, 50. And those companies, a lot of them don't have an architecture diagram. They don't even have a data flow diagram. They don't have, you know, like what are their, they, do, they have not mapped their, uh, their network. So this is a good time for you to then get the information. And a lot of time, because again, the carrot versus stick approach. When you have a carrot, things start moving, right? Like the teams will start drawing those diagrams for you. The team will start giving that information. They'll start offering that information over to you. So that's, that's one of the things that you, you should, the, the base is start off with an architecture review. Once you do that, you do your recon, right? That's the attack surface analysis. You go, to, go talk to your threat intel team. Go talk to your you know, purple team if you have one and start getting input into your, you know, get input into what their assets are. Like what is their cloud hosting provider? You know, what is their SaaS, you know, what is their SaaS environment? Um, and then also look at their source code, right? So this source code piece, only the third party has access to. So you kind of have to like give your third party a clear, direction as to what you're looking for. So some of the things that we look for are credentials, simple things like credentials, but we also look for how well this, what is the source code sanity, right? Like do they have things like, do they have just SQL you know, concatenation or do they actually have much more well-written and well thought out code? How difficult is it gonna to be to integrate the service once you purchase it onto your ecosystem, right? So that's what we are sort of looking for. Those are the signals we are looking for. Is it a completely different language that you don't have any clue? Like if someone's using Scala and you don't use Scala at all, that's, that's a good red flag to bring up to the acquisition team and say, hey, this is a completely different tech stack. It might, you might have to rewrite this. And this is where sort of you're starting to move from just wearing the security hat to actually the business hat because you're giving signals to the, to the corporate team that, hey, this might not be the, the, you might not 
you might have to you might have to build this into your deal. This might not be a six month deal, this might be a years long you know, sprint. And then we do network and infrastructure scan, we do a quick penetration test to find out what's the footprint. Because remember, a lot of time, once the deal gets closed, if it gets announced in the news, you have a lot of folks who, especially from the bug bounty program, they start like poking in, right? They start poking into, the D, in, into this target that was recently acquired, and they start submissions into your bug bounty program. So things like these that, if you have not thought of this, start like thinking through these things because the moment you close the deal and then the domain, you own the domain, the, the hackers will go run who is and they start seeing, oh, this is owned by Snapchat. This, the Snapchat is the parent domain and they start like poking and they start submitting. So just having that pipeline, that having that insight into what, who, into what domains they own, all of that, it's better to have it before the deal is closed. And then, of course, right now on everyone's mind there is SBOM, so just having an idea of what their open source sprawl is, and I can see a lot of people sighing, and that's, that's, that's the reality, right? Like, so you just want to know what kind of open source software they use. And finally, log. That's the most critical piece. If there's one takeaway you want to do from here is before the close of the deal, make sure that they turn their log collection off. And a lot of time in a lot of deals we saw that they did not have log collection turned on. They did not have cloud trail. They did not have cloud watch turned on. So we went and asked them to turn it on. And so when you do this, you can then, like, you have four to six weeks of log collect, logs at least at your disposal to go do forensic analysis to see if, you, if, there, if there is any indicators of compromise or if there is any malicious activity, right? So, so bare minimum, these are the things that you need to do. And remember, all this occurs in two to four weeks. So don't complicate things. You know, all these playbooks, just build them into your project management system, right? So and this, we just use our own Atlassian software. That's all we did. We just built this, and this is useful for tracking, right? Because remember, at the height of our acquisition timeline, we were doing about two deals per month, which means that we had multiple people on the team going and running the playbook, right? And so I have some people smiling here because it remembers of the time when we were doing multiple deals in, in, in the same month. Um, so having a playbook which is easily executable by multiple people on a team will, will save you a lot of time. So some of the uh, examples that I have that, that, come to, that come to mind that hopefully you can take away is we had deals where we started doing the diligence and we saw that there was an earlier ransomware event. So they had a ransomware event. The, the, the company or the target that we were trying to acquire had a ransomware event. So you have to be prepared for anything. How do you handle it from there? Once you, once you see that something like that occurs, now how do you start like you know mapping your purity diligence? So you have to go much more deeper. It's not enough to just do a network scan. Now you have to go do forensic analysis, right? So be prepared for that. We had a deal where we were talking to the target, and our threat in intel team gave, her, gave us credible input that they are being actually looked at by a nation actor. And so all of a sudden, your threat profile changes. And especially for Snapchat, because we are, our sort of adversary is a nation state, right? Like, so think about like someone wants to take over your account, and someone wants to do a blackmail. Or it's, it's a much more different threat profile, and some of the other social networks, are, I can see them nodding. But that's sort of your threat profile. So depending on who you are and what your threat profile is, you, you might have to consider doing much more deeper dives during the due diligence. Large and complex environment, what do you mean by large? Large and complex is essentially where we have things like hardware. We have a hardware division. So sometimes we go and acquire companies that manufacture components, right? Hardware components. And they have a completely different environment. They have, snap, they have labs. And in the labs, they have things like manufacturing equipment. They have IoT sprawl. So all of a sudden, from doing software, we started looking at companies which are doing hardware for, for a living, right? So, so that's a completely different way to look at due diligence there. And then irrespective of what the environment is, if the deal size starts going towards a threshold of like you know hundreds of million dollars, you just want to do a deep dive, right? Because at that price point, it's better to be sure and, and try to do as much due diligence as possible uh, to make sure that you're, you know, you're not owning or buying a company which has been breached. So, the takeaway here is try not to buy a breach. <laughs> and, and that sounds easy, but the more signals you can gather from the company before the close, the more risk you can present to your team so that they can then make the, make the call, right? So that's basically my takeaway. OK, so compromise, compromise assessment is basically a deep dive. So anytime you see that you want to go and find out a little bit more about the company and it's not a straightforward deal, and it's going to be integrated deeply into your ecosystem, you do something called as compromise assessment. Uh, as fancy as the 
as the term, as the name sounds, it's essentially installing an EDR and doing forensic analysis on the environment, right? Like at the end of the day, that's that's what you're doing. You're installing agents. You're waiting for four to six weeks. You're you're looking at the network. You're making sure that there is no indicators of compromise, right? And there are companies that that do this for a living, right? Who do you remember when you get breached? Like you, you pick up the phone, you call Mandiant, right? So there are a lot of companies that just do this. So make sure that you engage them way in advance. But when you engage them, you have to make sure that you have logs turned on. You have to have these assets early on so that you can then hand it over and make sure that they can do these investigations. So some of the things that we look for was, well, we just sometimes look for commodity malware infections. All of these we have learned through the hard way, so we wanted to pass on lessons for you. And then a lot of times the output of this can just become a can become input to the vulnerability management because you have a lot of times they, they would not have thought about like doing the proper network configurations on, on their network, right? Because, because these teams are resource constrained and they don't have dedicated security teams. So yeah, so essentially for a compromise assessment, it's the same. This can be done in parallel. So as we are doing the due, due diligence, you can do this in parallel. You, you can you, you essentially you go and install real-time monitoring agents, and then you do the analysis reporting. And then once it's done, it's basically considered like just any other assessment report, and you start mitigating, right? So hopefully during this time, you don't have to call Mandiant. That's that's basically the takeaway. It's like when you, when this is happening, which you know, hope, touch wood, we haven't done yet. So, um, so a lot of times when you're doing pre-acquisition due diligence, you might incur these you know, sort of like edge cases that I wanted to share and some of the lessons that we learned, right? So one thing is when you're trying to acquire any company that is based in the EU, you have to be really careful about their privacy policies. Like they're not comfortable with, with you going and installing agents onto their network. So remember this, only your team and a few people within the target are privy to the deal, right? Like everyone else has no clue that this is happening and you cannot reveal to them that you're actually evaluating them to buy them out, so, right? So this is the, during the due diligence period. So, so what we started doing is whenever we engage a team within EU, we would also include a data security statement, which means that we would give them an insight into what actually we are gonna do by, by installing these agents and that we're not collecting any employee productivity data or that we're not collecting anything related to employee, you know, um, you know, employee activity. It's more about the host activity, right? So just clearly telling them that this is what's happening saved us a lot of time because this, in one of the deals, took us almost two weeks to unblock, right? And, that, that's, and with deal timelines with between four to six weeks, two, losing two weeks is, is, is sort of like, it's a big deal. Some of the, and in another deal, when we were trying to acquire a company, we saw that the IT team did not have capability to, to actually install agents onto their hosts. They did not have a centralized way to manage their cloud assets, right? So this was a blocker because without that, we cannot even like roll out agents. Like you would have to like, and especially during COVID, they, the employees could not come to the office to get these agents installed remotely. And they had turned on things like no USB and things like that. And they also had turned on no remotely installed software. So, the, even, so in a way, security was becoming a blocker because they had turned on all these security features to not be able to install or run scripts remotely, but that's exactly what we wanted to do, right? So, so think about those things early on in your deal so that you can then do things like, well, you know, we are installing this new EDR, so everyone come to the office, and we had to kind of do it that way, right? So it sounds trivial, but just having this, when you're doing your due diligence and asking them for, hey, do you have a capability to actually install and maintain your hosts remotely? That's, that's a critical question to ask. And then once the deal closed, we realized that our own company did not have a BYOD policy, right? So Snapchat does not allow you to bring your own policy, but we had six months to a year, you know, supply chain nightmare. A lot of times people could not even find the laptops, right? Like, so how do you then, you know, allow the business to work with, with yourself? So we had to go back and redesign our, um, our InfoSec policy and we had to sort of work with the CarpSec team here and then put Beyond Trust and Zero Trust Networks and then we were able to like unblock these teams. So, so just being able to prepare for these kind of scenarios it was, was critical for us. And some of this we just, 
you know, we couldn't anticipate it. So even though you do everything right, there might be some curveballs, but just be ready for it and just adapt to it because the last thing you want to do is, is, is lift your hands and say, we, can't, we, we, you know, we can't enable the business, right? So again, I'm coming back to this slide. We finished all the pre-acquisition due diligence now. So we were, we were able to go and tell to the business that, hey, these are the immediate risks. These are the things that we want you to close. And then everything, now I'm going to talk about like the post-close uh, process. The post-close process, is essentially, you go and do a deep dive gap analysis and understand what the team is missing, right? Like what, what are the different controls that they're missing, and you prioritize that with their, with their business and with their security team, with their IT team, you prioritize that. And then you give them a multi-month roadmap and tell them, hey, this is how we are going to like start bringing you to the maturity that our company is, right? So that's the goal. The goal is at the end, at the end of the day, you want to bring the target to the same level of security as you. And at the end of the day, you want to also have an exit criteria defined because without an exit criteria, integrations can linger on for, you know, for in, indefinitely. And the exit criteria could be different for different teams, right? So I'll talk, you, I'll talk to you through some of the exit criteria that we chose for graduating the M&A, right? Like once you close the deal, when do you actually graduate them? So post-close integration, we kind of bucketed into three different areas. One is first, we try and find out all the asset inventory. And I know you might be thinking, hey, we already did this during the pre-acquisition due diligence form, right? Like we, we got all the asset inventory from them. Why are you doing this again? Well, guess what? Turns out that you only have you can you can only trust, but you can't verify, right? Before the deal is closed, you ask them a question and they'll give you an answer, and that's all. You're just going by that, right? So you actually don't know what all assets they have. We have found that 50% of the time that what the due diligence form is filled out is not accurate because someone is running a shadow IT, someone has gone and started their own cloud account somewhere. So working with their IT and SRE team after it's closed is crucial to understand the asset inventory. And once that's done, we do basic onboarding them security tooling. And here, the biggest thing is work with your corporate security team because here, the bare minimum you want to do is monitor their assets and their network. So if this is corp corporate security heavy because at a minimum, before even thinking about SaaS and DAS and all that fancy stuff, you want the basics covered and that your corporate security team is, is your friend there. And then finally, once the deal is closed, sit down with your business and the acquisition and talk about what is the business plan. Like, what are you trying to do with this company now that you have acquired? Are you going to integrate it within the next three months? Are you just going to you know, deprecate it within the next three months? Depending on this, you can plan accordingly because you don't want to go and write up this huge integration plan and the, and the company is like, well, we're just going to like sunset the product, right? So just having that open and honest conversation with the business will help your InfoSec team to be better prepared for the things that are coming down the lane. So this is sort of like our mental model to understand how integrations are done, right? So the main takeaway here is you want to know where, where, what are you going to do with the company once they're closed, right? So is, are, is it going to be a full integration? Is, is all the products and services are going to be integrated into your ecosystem? Are you going to all do a lift and shift into your network or into your cloud architecture, into your mic microservice architecture? So that usually would, would mean then you would have to then plan for it accordingly, right? So if it's just a acquire where you're just like going to deprecate the whole system and then you're just acquiring the talent and then maybe an SDK or something like that, then your integration effort is pretty low, right? So you can then go and prioritize it on another acquisition, which is actually slightly more complex, right? So having a mental model here and presenting this to the management can then help you get the resources that you need to go and do this integration, right? So there were times when we had limited integrations, which means they operated separately, but we then opened up APIs between, between both the companies, right? So that was, that was a different integration scenario. And then finally, we had a company where we just operated them with, at arm's length, and they kept operating it. Think about like something like GitHub or LinkedIn, where they just operate at an arm's length, and you just integrate as and when needed, right? So, so having this mental model and present to the business is crucial. Same thing, when you want to do an integration playbook, so remember the pre-acquisition due diligence playbook, I gave you a bunch of activities. The same way, post-close, you want to have a mental model of what are the priorities. You want to have a checklist. Again, 
when I say checklist, remember these checklists are extremely flexible. This is not a hard, hard coded checklist, right? You want to have a checklist. Checklists are good as long as they're not hard coded and as long as they're flexible, right? When you can go and modify them. So we went and talked to all our inter internal security teams. Look, depending on how big your security team is, everyone will have their own requirements. So go collect that requirements and then pre and create it into an operational playbook and present it to the target, right? So give them that, hey, this is what we expect from you. And they, once they look at that, take their input and understand which ones is actually rele relevant to them. Some of these activities may not be relevant to them and they'll be open and honest. So keep that in mind. So make sure that you're, you have a checklist, but make sure they're also flexible. So we just built out a playbook using our own project management system. You can have your own project management system, uh, but keep it simple, right? Just keep it something that you can actually assign it to someone and, their whole, and they can be held accountable. So we had, so for example, we had, we have our own productivity suite, right? Like we have, we use internally, we use G Suite, or you might be using Microsoft Office 365. A company that you acquire might come with their own piece of software, right? So you might think, oh, it's just another productivity suite. Well, what's the harm, right? Let, let, let them go and do it. But you have to understand that just adding an extra productivity suite means that your IT team now has to maintain and manage a whole new system. Your corporate security team won't like it because now they have to go and put this onto their SSO. They, and their detection and response team will not like it because they have to lie now write TTPs for a whole new productivity software. So just adding a new piece of software might sound pretty simple, but having that open and honest conversation with the target and explaining to them that why you cannot add this or why it's gonna be a huge burden or at least have a strong business reason before approving them, right? So that's sort of like what you want to do as, as, as an infosec team is to give them the context. Like the more context you give, we saw that there was less friction. Because just telling them, like we are the mothership, we're just going to tell no to you won't go well. But actually giving them the context and explaining to them went much well. And the same way, right, like cloud hosting provider. If you want to just say, OK, let, let's add Azure tomorrow, that's a whole different conversation with the infrastructure security team if you are just an AWS shop or a GCP shop, right? So, so they have those conversations early on. Yeah, so the big takeaways here are to get the right inventory, go and talk to your, to your finance team. Because at the end of the day, they are the ones who are going to pay the bill. And guess what? The moment the deal closes, your target is going to put all their bills onto your finance team. So a lot of time we found that when we matched the inventory with the finance team, we added another 20, 20 25% of the inventory. So do that. Make sure that you have shared ownership of critical accounts on day one. I'm exaggerating on day one, but like try to get it done as quickly as possible. But because remember, we are in an age where you know things like reduction in force could happen. There could be folks who just leave after the deal. But they might be the only owners of an account. Like remember, these are small teams, like 20, 25 people, right? So there could just be one admin who's holding on to all the critical accounts. And then you lose them when that person you know, decides to leave the company and things like that. So uh, shared ownership, if there's one thing that you can take away from this talk, is make sure that you have shared ownership on day one. And that's, that's a difficult conversation, but you have to have that early on so that you, can, you know what their critical accounts are and you, and you have your IT team or your production security team has access to those. And then make sure that you communicate early and often with your business, right? So every month we started sending out critical touch points and saying where the deal and how it's progressing. Because giving that, that information then meant that the business then came back to us and say, hey, you know what, three months later, we, we are planning to completely add a new you know, feature to this product or this service. So sometimes having that communication early on gave us more input than, that, that we could then use for our integration plan. Right? Just working in silos won't help. So go talk to all the teams that are involved and have like monthly communication syncs or newsletters or the ways that your com team and we, we, the way that your team communicates with your company, you make use of those channels. So finally, we then went back to our customers, who in this case are targets, and then we asked them, hey, you know, did, at the end of the day, you want to make sure that all of this is helping them improve their security posture, right? So you could be doing all these activities, but you want to make sure that this is actually helping them. So we went and directly asked them after every deal. We made it a point to ask the target, hey, how did this help you and your security posture? And sometimes they gave us very valid feedback. They said, hey, don't give us huge reports, right? So what we did was, we, in, in lieu of transparency, we gave them the whole report and said, hey, you know, you have a penetration testing report, go fix these issues. But they just wanted to tell us exactly what to do. Don't, don't give me a report. Just tell me exactly what to do. So that was, that was a useful 
input. They also wanted to have you know, high level overview. They want to know what's coming down for them 30, 60, 90 days and a year, right? So give them this information in advance. And we found that at least 90% of them said that it actually helped, right? So this, this was a success metric is like, no matter what we do or how much security controls or you know, checks we do, does the target actually think this is valuable? And to our surprise, they did find it useful, right? So for us, that was, that was a win. Finally, so if you see, we started with the pre-acquisition process, and then we did the gap analysis and found out what controls they were missing. Then we found out that how to do, how to do the integration, right? And then finally, we had a graduation criteria. Like for some companies, we had a graduation criteria such as like, okay, you, you will be onboarded to our bug bounty program. That's when you sort of are like graduated, right? So then there was a company where we said, your graduation criteria is when we sunset all your services. And the reason was because they had active contracts, right? So sometimes you have to remember that these companies walk in with their own customers and their own contracts. So you can't just sunset them the second day. So you wanna, then you, you, then you end up owning a service which is around for a couple of years until those contracts run out, right? So having, those, having that kind of like due diligence helps you to know how to prepare and, and give the right resources. So my takeaway is make sure that you ba balance the business and security priorities because those two sometimes could be, you know, in a, those two sometimes could be in tangent with each other, right? So you, you want to, as a security team, you sometimes want to take a step back and evaluate what direction that you, the team wants to go to, but the business might just want to sprint and try to integrate and try to open up, you know, holes and try to start, start getting data from each other, right? So make sure that you're balancing those business and uh, security priorities. Cross-functional collaboration is key here. There is, there is no way you, your team can work in silo and by yourself. You have to work with the finance team, you have to work with the legal and IT teams. So have these things regularly with these teams and make sure that you're getting their input. Oh, there you go. Okay, yeah, so the one thing that I would also say is be humble because a lot of times you wanna make sure that the team that you're acquiring also is able to give you input. Sometimes they might have much more robust practices in a certain area that, than you, you yourself, right? So make sure that you learn from each other with the, with the team that's coming in to your ecosystem and don't make it seem like, hey, we know it all and then we're just gonna give you a bunch of tasks to do, right? So that's, that's probably not the best approach. The best approach that we found is to be able to say, hey, this is the security control. This is how we plan to mitigate it. Are you able to adopt it? And sometimes they came back and said, we, had a, we have a much more robust control and we were able to say, that's fine, that works for us. And again, this is the key, communicate early and communicate often with your business, with the target that you have acquired and make sure that they both align and the plans are in sync so that you're able to then do the integration correctly. And finally, I wanna thank a lot of folks who built this program initially, it's, it's impossible for me to build this program by myself, but I wanna thank the leadership, Nick who's here, who built the program initially, and then I built on that foundation, our leadership, because a lot of time, while you're doing M&A, things will go wrong. Like this is, um, th th these are complex integration scenarios, right? Like so people get laid off, deals fall through, but having a lead the back of your leadership is critical for any m and security program. Hopefully you found this interesting, and if you have any questions, I'm ready to take them now. Oh, go for it. Hey, buddy. Uh, hey. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> hey, uh, I was wondering if you could go into a bit more detail around like the amount that you provide for these runbooks. Like if you have a recon runbook, for example, is it as far as run these tools in this order and then aggregate, or like what does that tend to look like? Absolutely, so we have, yes, the, for specifically for the recon run book, we do have a couple of tools, but we try to go in as much detail as possible for each activity, and say for, for example, for cloud configuration, depending on what cloud they have, we say run you know, the industry standards, scout, scout speed and things like that, and get, give us a picture. And then for credentials, we have like tools. So we give them, we give, we try to make this as consistent as possible because we don't want to have inconsistencies, right? For one detour and another. So that's sort of like what, do, Nick, do you have anything to add here? Uh, 
No, I think that's spot on, actually. I remember writing the Scout Suite playbook uh, years ago. I think it was 2018 when I did this. Uh, it's so cool to see these slides because that like overview graphic, the left to right, I actually mm -hmm. drew that maybe mm -hmm. 2018 and now we're in 2023. Strong so. foundations, right? Th thank you, Vinay. But the, mm -hmm. the question I wanted to ask is more like an anecdote. Can you mm -hmm. share maybe an interesting technical example without exposing too much detail, of course, you know, we're, we're, we're in company here. Of, of findings that you found that were particularly novel or unusual that you had to work through, either as part of pre-due diligence mm -hmm. or, or as part of post-close, as, as part of the deep dives. I think it'd be really beneficial for the audience maybe here, an, an interesting technical example. Fair enough. Um, one, one thing that comes to mind was the Slap Lab scenario, right? Like we, we covered a company um, where, where they were basically manufactured components for our spectacles vision. So all this is public information. Um, it's called, uh, I believe, Wave Optics. So there, we, we as a company don't don't have shared accounts, right? We just don't allow shared accounts. You know, you, you, you everyone has to have their own account. But we had a scenario here where basically they run a lab where they're testing these, you know, equipment which run for 24 hours, 36 hours sometimes, right? So our expiration policy is eight hours. Like, guess what happens when someone finishes a shift for eight hours and then walks away? You don't want that to expire because they, the, those test cases they're running sometimes might take 24 hours. The right? auth token is being revoked. Exactly. So, and so now we need to work around that. Yeah. No. So you remember what's, that? What's <laughs> Go next? For it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so basically, we had to then like take a step back and say that hey, this, these scenarios might work for a software company where everything is SaaS, but might not work for a you know, lab scenario where they're running these tests for 24, 46 hours. So we had to go and rethink this strategy, right? So, so being flexible and not just saying, well, this is a rigid security policy and we won't change it. That's kind of, that's one of the things that came to mind. And another thing that came to mind is we had a scenario where the company was using, you know, like a, a software called Cadence. And if you wanted to upgrade them, that would be like $10 million, right? So, so we, we said like, oh, you, wanna, you have to be on, a, on, on the most latest and greatest software, but you don't realize that, hey, that software upgrade can take $10 million, right? So, so we had to go back and say, we want to, we'll instead isolate this network and completely cordon it off instead of trying to be like, hey, everything has to be updated, right? So, so taking that step back and actually giving novel solutions to them, which might just be simple sometimes, is super useful. Yeah, for, for the lapse case, we had to allow longer sessions, but we put in place compensating controls to make sure those rooms were effectively locked and under strict access controls, which nominally maybe they wouldn't be as strict, to allow the spectrum analyzers, I think that's what they were, mm -hmm. to, to basically complete their runs. And if you guys are familiar with that, like these things are, 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 are highly uh, uh, methodical and they need to complete their, their analysis process before data can be generated for, for them to act on in, in a lab setting, which is completely different than how our company operated. So we needed to learn what to do with this. And yeah, I, th I think that's super helpful because you as the m and security team cannot do everything by yourself and having key partners like this is critical, right, basically. I, I saw one more person raise their hand if they had a question. Yeah, uh, have you had any instance where some of the vulnerabilities that was found cannot be fixed within the target time of acquisition? And what happens then? Do you extend the date or that, that, exceptions? Can you uh, talk a little bit more about it? Awesome, yeah, I'm, I'm smiling because that, that happens all the time. That happens, anytime you do a due diligence, you're gonna uncover a bunch of issues, right? And then you have to prioritize them. There were times when we found critical and high issues, we had to sit down with the company and work with them and say, you have to fix this before the deal. You do get the opportunity to build it within the deal. This is where you go to your legal team and say, hey, they have an issue, but they won't be able to fix it within your time timeline because this is an authentication issue that requires the rewriting their entire authentication framework. So you go and build it into the deal that within 90 days of close, you actually work with our security team and you close it. So, so literally there are times when you, you want to tell them, don't try to fix this because this is a complex fix, please let's close the deal and then once you come into our security team, we'll have our AppSec team help you and then build, build, you know, build, the, build the mitigation control. So, not, so the answer is not try to fix everything, right? Even though if it's critical or high, sometimes you want to make sure that it's done correctly. So that was a good question. Yeah, thanks, thanks for bringing that up. Hi, so this is actually what I do. I do diligence as, a, as an external vendor. Awesome. Um, so, but what we focus on is really sort of the SDLC uh -huh. and software architecture and code. And it seems like what you're doing is kind of bundling IT, SDLC, operational security. Uh, and I'm just wondering how you think about that or if you treat those as separate silos and like how you, how, like, 
what, how do you view the relative importance of those things, mm -hmm. um, like the different kind of, kind of security silos as part of a deal? Uh, excellent question. I, I'm glad. I, I'd love to chat with you offline as well. But yeah, for, so depending on the type of deal, we prioritize the activities differently, right? So if we are doing a hardware deal, we're not really worried much about their code sanity because essentially we're going to most likely have that hardware, you know, the firmware integrate as part of our Spectacles firmware anyway. So that that's not like the goal of that assessment. Whereas if we are doing, you know, we're buying it buying a company for just for their SDK, or if we're buying a company for their SaaS service, which is going to integrate immediately into our ecosystem, then we go and look at the, closely at the code sanity, right? So, so really looking at what the deal is, and then, so there are deals like where we looked at and we, we knew out of the gate that we're going to completely shut down the service. It's Acquihire. So we, we did, took, took a different approach. There were deals where we were going to shut down their network. So that was not prioritized, whereas we, we wanted to keep their you know, code, so that was prioritized. But yes, absolutely, so that having that context early on, and that's why working with the business very early on and asking, hey, even though your plans might change, just tell us like, what do you think you are going to do 30, 60, 90 days after the deal closes? Just having that and then going and scoping your assessment is critical. But I'd love to chat more about like how that SDLC piece you look at and, and things like that, so awesome. Well, thank you so much, folks. Hopefully you had a, you know, you had a good takeaways, but I had fun, thank you.